Hello and welcome to the Texas Public Policy Foundation. My name is Andrew Brown and I have the privilege of overseeing child and family policy for the foundation. Uh, today's event is actually a very special event with our friends at the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture. I've been privileged over the years to work closely with the staff and fellows over at the Austin Institute. And I can tell you, they are one of the finest organizations operating in this space right now. And before we begin, I'd just like to thank them and their staff for all their help in putting this event together. Those of you who have been following the work of the Texas Public Policy Foundation in child and family policy over the years will know that everything that we do is rooted in the belief that the family is the foundation of a strong and free society. The relationship between a parent and child, whether that be through birth or adoption, is one of the most unique and important relationships in history. And it's for this reason that Western civilization, and especially American civilization, has gone above and beyond to protect the relationship between parents and children against unnecessary and unwarranted interference by the state. In fact, the United States Supreme Court famously held in its decision in Troxel v. Granville that the interest of parents in the care, custody, and control of their children is perhaps the oldest of the fundamental liberty interests recognized by this court. And when you go back in the history of Supreme Court decisions, we have more than 100 years of Supreme Court precedent protecting the rights of parents and children in their relationship with one another. Nevertheless, there is an ongoing tension between the rights of families and attempts by government to interfere with decision-making on the part of parents with respect to their children. And we've seen this most clearly over the last year and a half, especially as it relates to decisions regarding education and healthcare of children. Now, while no right is ever absolute, the growing incursion of government into private decisions made by families should be cause for concern. And our discussion today will explore the rights and responsibilities of parents and the limits of both parental authority over children as well as government authority over the family. Joining us today is Dr. Joseph Price, a professor of economics at Brigham Young University. He serves as a senior fellow with the Austin Institute and holds a number of research fellowships with organizations like the National Bureau of Economic Research, the Institute of Labor and Economics, the Sutherland Institute, and the Wheatley Institution. Dr. Price is the author of more than 50 academic articles on topics that range from marriage, parental time investments in children, gender differences in competitive settings, racial discrimination, and how do we use incentives to encourage positive behaviors in children. He received a BA in economics from Brigham Young University and a PhD in economics from Cornell University. Dr. Price and his wife, Emily, are the parents of seven children. And he told me before this that he will be happy to stick around and answer any questions you have about raising your own kids, given that he <laughs> is an expert. Before we begin our conversation, though, I'd like to invite Dr. Kevin Stewart, who's the executive director of the Austin Institute to the stage to share a few brief remarks. Dr. Stewart is a brilliant thinker on issues related to family and culture, and I am proud to consider him a friend. Thanks, Andrew. And what a pleasure to be back in this beautiful space for an event with our friends at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and especially on this day when today the heartbeat bill has taken effect, not, not stymied by a court. So what a great day to gather and talk about the family and the future of the family. And I think we're in for a really great treat. I can hardly say it better than um, than Andrew has already done, so I won't, I won't duplicate it too much, but just to set the scene a bit at the 30,000 foot view, um, the, the state will attempt to exhaust all relationships. That's kind of the nature of the state. And yet in tension with that is the fact that the state depends upon the family to provide that which it cannot, which is well-formed citizens. That's kind of the starting point for our relationships in politics. And so that's exactly what we mean or part of what we have in mind when we say that there is no more fundamental institution in society than the family. And the family turns out to be a great barometer 
for society as a whole. If you have healthy, strong families that are in a good way, healthy, strong marriages and great relationships between families with ki and kids, you will have a healthy, strong society. And if you don't have a healthy, strong family institution, you will have a very sick society. Uh, and so it's, it's right and good and sensible to focus on this most fundamental relationship, especially these days, when there's a lot of concern and a great deal of words have been written recently about the decline of institutions and the sort of sad state that many of our society's institutions are in. As we're looking not just to diagnose, but also to prescribe, we have to get to the cause, not just the symptoms. And so getting all the way down to the most fundamental level is the place to go. And so with that, I'll turn it over um, to our speakers. If this is the first time you've ever heard of or seen anything from the Austin Institute, I think you'll get a great example today. We are a social science research institute. Uh, it's social science for the family, um, about the family. And uh, Dr. Price is one of our founding senior fellows. So he's been around us. We've worked with him for as long as the Institute has existed. And um, you should ask him in Q&A about things like um, baseball, which we've worked on uh, with him. <laughs> Uh, and the role of fatherhood with baseball, and and also about um, if you, especially if you have kid if you are in college or have kids going to college about the importance of single sex dorms research that um, we've not yet gotten where it needs to be, <laughs> but it, but which exists. But um, that's all for Q and A for now. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. For those of you joining us online, there is going to be Q&A at the end, as well as for those of you who are in the room. Uh, if you are online, there is a way that you can message your uh, questions in, and those will be conveyed to me by the utmost in technology known as text messaging. <laughs> so at the end, I'll be on my phone a little bit uh, looking at questions. I am not um, browsing social media. <laughs> Dr. Price, much of your work focuses on the critical role that parents play in the lives and the futures of their children. And intuitively, I feel like we all know this, but I'm interested in learning more about what your research has found and what is it that we don't know that we should know? Sure. Yeah, I love the way how you used intuitively. Uh, the other day, my daughter asked me if I had made any scientific discoveries. And I explained a couple of my scientific discoveries. And one of those is that parents spend a lot more time with their firstborn child than their secondborn child. And my daughter said, you could have asked any seven-year-old and they would have told you that. <laughs> so really, my, like, my interest in these parental investments came from the fact that I had three kids early in grad school. And one of my professors said to me, don't you know about the quantity quality trade-off? And, and what, what she meant was that, you know, as you have more kids, you have less resources to go around. And so then quality uh, drops. And it got me thinking about what do I do as a parent? Because the, the metaphor there is a pie. And we split up the pie and we give the pie each of the kids. But I started to kind of watch myself as a parent. And what I realized is the most important things I did with my kids, they were all there. We ate dinner as a family. So there, it's not like I split the pie up, like my presence with them they all got to be part of that. And then when we read together, we were all part of that. So it made me realize that maybe the pie metaphor wasn't the right way to think about it. So I started looking at parental reading time with their children. Now you might think that like, it's obvious that reading to your children is really important, but even that one simple parenting investment, when I mentioned it to professors, they would be like, oh no, it's just selection. And what they mean is like good parents read to their kids and those kids would have been just fine even if they hadn't read to them. And so I started thinking like, well, how, do you, how would you actually test to see if reading to your kids is important? It's really hard to run a randomized control trial, um, like tell some parents to read to their kids, uh, tell others not to, though there's some people doing that right now, which is fantastic. But what I did is I went back to that pattern where the firstborn child gets, a lot, gets read to a lot more than the secondborn child. And the gap is actually bigger if the kids are spaced further apart. So we looked at families that had a miscarriage, which basically caused the children to be a little bit further apart than you'd expect and then did a little bit of kind of technical wizardry. And it, we were able to show that reading to your kids is really important. But what was fascinating is that if we just looked within a family and said, okay, which of the kids do you read to more? It would make it look like reading to your kids actually made them do worse in school. Really? Yeah, well, it's because parents compensate when they discover that one of their kids is struggling, they read to them more. So like if, if you just naively came into the empirical question and said, oh, let's just look at the relationship between reading to your kids and test scores, you'd actually see a negative relationship within the family because parents actually adapt and respond to the needs of their children. Well, that's fascinating. I'm experiencing that in my own life. I'm nowhere in your league. I yeah. have two kids, a three-year-old okay, yeah. and one-year-old. And 
a lot of what I've been thinking about recently is, okay, how much time yeah. am I spending with the older over yeah. the younger, the younger over the older? And you know, a lot of it right now is just based on needs. The one-year-old yeah. is climbing on everything. And, mm. you know, you're know, you constantly hovering and yeah. the three-year-old is a little bit more independent. Yeah. Um, but that's really solid information uh, to know in terms of how we're intentional yeah. about investing in our children. Yeah. Um, promoting marriage and family formation. It's a major topic of conversation recently in the public policy sphere, especially amongst conservatives. And one of the issues that we struggle with and that I've been personally thinking about is, okay, how much can government influence marriage and family formation? And how much should government influence marriage and family formation? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, so I was with Brad Wilcox at a state's, we were talking to their director of health and human services. And we were just talking about ways to help alleviate poverty, particularly for women with children. And, and, you know, we have this poverty toolkit that we use to try to help people. And I said, have you guys thought of promoting marriage as part of your poverty toolkit? And I don't know, you guys can guess what they said, but they were like, the answer shocked me because I hadn't, it wasn't like part of my cultural script. They said, why would we want to subject women to that barbaric institution? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, that, that was kind of like an extreme view on this. I, I hope it doesn't represent the views of many. It wasn't Texas, was it? It wasn't, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, but it, it got me realizing that actually some people do have this script and, and, and sadly, maybe that script comes from dysfunctional marriages where there's domestic violence or abuse. Um, but my experience has been that, that marriage is an institution that can often bring stability and safety to the life of a woman. That's probably better than the, the typical dating relationships or serial cohabitation or other things. So it was just interesting that they were afraid of an institution that I've, I've seen as largely protective of women in general. Um, now, from a public policy perspective, how do you influence marriage? I, I think marriage involves long run planning which is, it is a long run commitment. And so for people to make long run decisions, they need to have um, the cognitive margin to do that, the, the cognitive buffer. So the problem is if you're right on the edge of your finances, if you're right on the edge of, of your stress level, it's really hard to plan for the future. You, you kind of go into myopia, you, you go into like survival mode and doing things right in the moment. And so I really think that one way we can foster people's longer in decision making is give them that buffer. Mm -hmm. And often that can come through um, access to training programs or stable employment. This is what's amazing is the military has done such a great job at promoting marriage because it creates that stable buffer for people. They have, they have basically stable employment for a long period of time. They can start making plans for their future. They, have, they kind of have their health care taken care of. They have their education taken care of. That's a really neat to think about what would an institution look like that looks like the military, <laughs> military just doesn't involve, you know, uh, war or other things like that. Right? So. Well, that's an interesting point. And we inevitably come back to issues of poverty yeah. and issues of economics, yeah. this idea of, well, it's the high cost of housing yeah. that's driving down marriage and family formation, or it's the high cost of childcare that's driving down marriage and family formation. Yeah. How important of a factor are those um, inputs and are there other inputs that we're not really looking at that we should be looking at? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's really interesting that people would think they need to own a home to be married or that somehow there's like things that need to be in place in order to be married. Um, I love uh, one of the endowed shares at BYU is the Marjorie Pay Hinckley. And when she was proposed to, uh, this was during the Great Depression, her, um, her boyfriend, Gordon B. Hinckley said, you know, I, I think it'd be great to get married, but I only have a hundred dollars. <laughs> And her answer was, well, man, I was just really hoping to have a husband. And you're saying I get $100 on top of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that's a totally, that's like a, that's like a totally different script than we have today, which is, and here's the, here's the beautiful thing about that model of marriage is, because it's largely what my wife and I did. We probably had $1,000 when we got married. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't own a home. Um, we bought our first car together. Is The neat thing about it is we've grown rich together. And so whenever we look back on our past together, we have this reference point of absolute poverty. And so, you know, whatever level of um, prosperity we've experienced gets compared back to those early years and actually gives us a lot more happiness. Do you see variations in the factors influencing decisions based on uh, class? So 
for example, I got married a little bit later in my late yeah. 20s. I had already established a career and was working. Um, many of my peers were the same way. And some of the studies that I've read, when you look at folks who are in my cohort, my generation, folks that are like me, yeah. for lack of a better term, some of the factors that they're pointing to are time for vacation or sure. other interests that they have is influencing their decision not yeah. to get married or start a family. Do you see wide variations like that amongst class? I don't know. I've never, I mean, that's a really interesting, because uh, I think I was talking about economic things that have to be in place right. in order to get married. What you're saying is there might be things I have to give up right. when I get married. I might have to give up my single lifestyle or my ability just to travel or golf all the time. Um, and so that's, that's an interesting, I guess for me, like I created such a strong friendship with Emily that that became the thing I wanted. I mean, I mean, that's what we mean by forsaking all others is like it involves golf and travel. Uh, I mean, I've, I've loved traveling. And so that was a big change to, to become married, but it's a trade-off. I, I thought I got a good deal. <laughs> so, and then, you know, and parenting involves the same trade-off. So like, like marriage and parenting is different. Like once you have that first child, your life changes in so many ways and you have to give up you have to forsake things. It, um, I mean, that was the, the hardest thing with um, having seven kids is it's really hard to, to travel. Uh, we, we did take, we flew down to Austin once and I just remember us on the airplane with all our kids and uh, we were just trying to make sure they behaved well, but it, you know, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a challenge to, to pull that off. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that my <laughs> wife and I are traveling tomorrow okay. we're going <laughs> to visit my family and everybody's going to go to the beach together. Yeah. And I woke up this morning and I said, all right, vacation's tomorrow. And she looks at me and she goes, it's not vacation. It's a family trip. <laughs> it's a family trip. <laughs> okay. It's a different level yeah. of stress. You're not going to be laying by the pool. Yeah. You're going to be chasing your kids <laughs> yeah. around. That's right. Um, but that kind of goes back to what you had mentioned earlier about you and your wife are based on a friendship. Yeah. Right. And one of the reasons you're in town, other than being with us today, was you delivered a talk last night for the Austin Institute on friendship-based dating yeah. and marriage mismatch. Yeah. I'm interested in learning a little bit more because the marriage mismatch I've not heard of before. Yeah, so the marriage mismatch is this idea that for whatever reason, um, when you look at couples, the husband tends to have at least as much education or more. The husband tends to be about the same age or older. The husband tends to have the same income or higher. So this is called hypergamy. So basically, you know, women are marrying up. They're marrying a man that has either more education or more income. So if you couple that idea of hypergamy, with the fact that women get 60% of college degrees, hmm. you end up with this mismatch. So if a woman with a college degree is looking for a guy with a college degree, the problem is there's not gonna be enough of those guys to go around. So that's a structural mismatch. I think you also have this frictional mismatch, which is even if that guy exists out there, it's, it's hard to find that person. I mean, I think we thought like online dating would solve all these, these issues, but what, I'm, um, what I've been advocating with my students at BYU is that uh, this idea of friendship-based dating. And the neat thing about friendship-based dating is it lowers the cost, it lowers the expectations. And it really is nice because it's exactly what we do when we enter the business world. We go out to lunch with people. Now is asking someone out to lunch, is that a date? We don't call it a date in the business world. We call it a, a networking. <laughs> so, I was like, maybe we could call dating networking, but it, basically it's the ability just to and the thing is, when I take people out to lunch, sometimes I create a friendship with that person. And, and we, we start to interact outside of the business world together um, because of that friendship that's created. Um, and so that's really what I think we want to change young adults' view is this different type of dating. It's still one-on-one. -on -one. You can still have the chivalry of paying for it or inviting or planning ahead, um, but it just sets the expectations super low. It's just an hour. We're going to spend an hour together. And at the end of the hour, maybe we're better friends. Maybe we want to do it again. Maybe we start to feel some romantic attraction to each other. But the neat thing is that that romantic attraction doesn't have to happen. The friendship can happen independent of, of the romance. Do you find that that is a recipe for happier, healthier marriages? Have you gone to that level of folks who have engaged in a more friendship style of dating? Yeah, I mean, so here's two examples. So I dated over, I went on dates with over 50 girls in high school. Right. Uh, so, but, but it was because, but it was, I had a lot of friends. I, I would say is I had a lot of friends. I had a lot of people that I wanted to get to know. And so, you know, I'd be going to a basketball game and I'd say, Hey, do you want to come to the basketball game with me? Right. Or I like to, I go, like to go on hikes. So I'd be like, Hey, do you want to go on a hike? Or I like to play tennis. You want to come play tennis with me? So really what, what happened then is I I'd met in all these people. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about them. I genuinely just loved people. It was just like, I loved being with them. And the neat thing then is when I finally met my wife, when I was 21, uh, 
I can't, was this like, <laughs> I was like, wow, oh my goodness. Because all of the other girls I dated, I was like, oh, I love this about this person and this about this person and this about this person. And then to have all of those things I loved come together in one person. Uh, so, I mean, this is kind of, I told the students last night, this is super crazy, but my wife got engaged after only knowing each other 12 days, which is totally crazy. Oh, wow. But it was because like, once, once we met each other, we just became immediate friends and we started spending all day together for the entire Christmas break. And then it just naturally, that friendship just naturally blossomed into something where we knew we wanted to be together as a, as a couple. And so, oh, that's incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then now my daughter, she's been on dates with, I think, over 30 different boys. And I love that. I love the fact that she's learning about herself. She's learning how to talk to people. She's learning how to set boundaries and navigate a, a world where she's going to, you know, in the future, she's going to have a boss that's a guy and she's going to have to know how to navigate boundaries and ask people for things and, and have conversations. How is it for you as a father? influencing that and do you take a more proactive approach do you let her come to you what's your I mean we have a really good relationship I mean one of the nice things is she lets me read her texts which <laughs> which I don't know like if if many parents do that with their 17 year old but what I love about it is I'm like oh who's who's this person who's this person who's this person and she just she's really open with me I love that part of it and then I've also just been really clear with her that um, twice as a teenager I asked a girl on a date and and she said no in both cases, she called me back half, half an hour later and said, my mom told me I have to go out with you. <laughs> but in both cases, it was because they had a boyfriend. Ah. And then, you know, after, at the end of those dates, um, in both cases, they said, you know, I'm really glad we went on that date. I had a lot of fun. I kind of wish I didn't have a boyfriend. And so to like share that narrative with my daughter and say, there, there's, there's a trade-off. Like when you have a boyfriend, it cuts you off from these other opportunities. And so I've just been really grateful that she's, a, she's just an amazing person. She's super fun to be with. I, I enjoy going on dates with her. And so I'm not surprised that there's lots of boys that want to go on dates with her. And then the other thing is she asks, she asks boys on dates. So she's kind of bucking a, a cultural tradition that I think is a little dysfunctional. Very cool. And going back to some of the policy yeah. aspects of marriage and family formation, yeah. your home state senator, Mitt Romney, yeah. caused a little bit of a stir in conservative circles, especially yeah. earlier this year, when he proposed the Family Security Act, which amounted to a fundamental reorganization of the social safety net or welfare system. And what the Family Security Act proposes is a near universal child allowance, which is paid for by substantial changes to the tax code, elimination of certain welfare programs. Uh, conservative proponents of that proposal say that it will promote marriage and family formation and reduce child poverty while simplifying and streamlining many government programs. Now, conservatives who opposed that plan um, argue that it's gonna encourage greater dependency and it's gonna disincentivize work. And if you hadn't followed that debate earlier this year, I'd encourage you to go back. I mean, there were some fascinating articles back and forth amongst many luminaries of the conservative marriage and family formation world. And Brad Wilcox being one of them who weighed in quite heavily um, and several of all of them weighed in as well as others over at AEI National Review. Uh, it's an absolutely fascinating dialogue, but I'm interested in your thoughts on Senator Romney's proposal and the debate, especially that it sparked among conservatives on how does government influence and should, how should we be approaching this issue? Sure, yeah. So here's kind of one context to think about it. So I got to meet with a governor one time and this governor said, I wanna get rid of all marriage penalties. Like that was a concern to him. So there's all these marriage, marriage penalties built into every um, public program. How do I get rid of them? And, and the first thing I said is, you do know what this will create. And he said, basically, I want um, transfer programs to be based on individual income, not on couple income. So that is definitely one way to get rid of marriage penalties because then actually like, it doesn't really matter if you're living together or if you're married, like women with children would still have access to all of the same uh, safety net programs. And so that was his proposal. He's like, we should get just have it all be based on each person's income, not on the couple's income. So that is definitely one way to get rid of marriage penalties. I said, you do know that this would create a massive transfer of government support to my wife. Hmm. Okay, that's the trade-off. Like the only way, the only way to avoid marriage penalties is to allow women like my wife, who actually have experienced high levels of family income but have very low levels of personal income to have all access to all of the government programs that go to people with low income. So, so that, that's tricky then, because then you look at my wife, you know, we live in a nice neighborhood, we're, we're well taken care of. I don't really think of us as, uh, you know, in need of welfare assistance, but under that program, we would be eligible. And that's really what I think 
Mitt Romney's getting at with the, the kind of universal child credits, which is the neat thing about it is it gets rid of all of these marriage penalties. It gets rid of any disincentives to work. Now the downside is some of that money goes to my kids. And uh, you know, there's a part of us that are Rawlsian that are like, families like mine shouldn't be getting that money. But the neat thing about having it be universal is that it gets rid of all of those benefit cliffs. It gets rid of the marriage penalties. And so really then people have this safety net that we know children are gonna be taken care of at least at some basic level. And then it allows people to do what's best for their own family, which is for many people, the best thing they can do is get married. And you'd hate for them to be like, oh, if I get married, I'm gonna lose this thing. Or it might mean going and working more, but some people are like, oh, if I work more, I might lose my Medicaid or I might lose these other things. So it's, it's a really interesting idea that you might be able to decouple support from the positive decisions that people make that might disqualify them from some of those benefits. Absolutely. And while we're on the subject of financial incentives, you and I were recently discussing child poverty sure. and how we measure childhood poverty. And you proposed a, something that I found fascinating <laughs> was when we measure childhood poverty, we also need to take into account parental time yeah. with their children as a metric that influences our child poverty rate. Explain that a little bit. Okay, this is gonna be a little hard. You're gonna, you're gonna have to visualize for a second because if I had a whiteboard, I would draw it. But in economics, we have this thing called an isoquant. Okay. Right. So, uh, uh, we need to get Dr. Vance again down here. To <laughs> so basically um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, put, we're gonna put money on one axis. We'll put money on the Y axis right here. This is money. This is how much income your family has. And this is how much time you can provide your children. And so what an isoquant does, so what, what a poverty line does is it creates a, a, a vertical, or sorry, a horizontal line right, right here that says if your income is below some level, you're poor. Okay. It doesn't take into account any of the time resources that you can provide their ch your children. So that's a, that's a horizontal line like this. Now, if we thought that time was the only thing that mattered, then we could draw a vertical line. We could say, you know, all the parents that can give their kids this much amount of time, we'll call them not poor. And then those that can't give them enough time, we'll call them time poor. What an isoquant does is it allows you to trace out the relationship between time and money. So what, what the isoquant says is there's different ways to provide for your children. Okay, some people can actually provide for their children by giving them lots of material resources, but not a lot of time. Whereas other families can actually give their children lots of time, but not a lot of material resources. And those kids might turn out equally the same. So we're just saying everyone along this line is different combinations of time and money, and those kids will all be fine. So if you're above that line, your kids will be fine. If you're below that line, then we might need to worry a little bit. So I always love to use Charlie Bucket uh, as the example of the far right kid, because you know Charlie Bucket's dad works at the toothpaste factory, makes almost no money, uh, but he he has uh, a mom and a dad that are married and love him and spend time with him. He has four grandparents that spend time with him and love him. So he's like so far out in terms of time investment that he's a good. He he actually is the kind of kid we all love. And like I don't know, do any of us worry that Charlie's going to turn out okay? Like he's going to turn out fine. And then you have Ruka Salt, who's like all the way on the left side, <laughs> like all the money in the world, you know, the father with the nut factory, uh, all the money in the world, but, but there's something lacking. She's a brat. Mm -hmm. And so there's this interesting trade-off between uh, time and money. And I think a lot of times as parents, we don't, we don't actually have to face that trade-off. Mm -hmm. But here's the case where I had to face it in grad school. Uh, I was very busy at the time, but we, we set aside Monday evening for family time. And right at the last minute, this student says, I, I really want you to tutor me. I have a test tomorrow. I'll pay you 25 bucks an hour to tutor me for two hours. So I call up Emily and I'm like, Emily, do you want the two hours or do you want the 50 bucks? <laughs> I don't know, do you guys have a guess? She said, I want, I, want the, I want the time. Yeah, okay. So he gets desperate and he says, Emily, or he says, Joe, I'll pay you 50 bucks an hour. So I call Emily back. I'm like, Emily, do you want the two hours or do you want the hundred bucks? She says, I'll take the hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> but what this is acknowledging is there is a trade-off. Like there, there are times in our life where we, we, we trade time for money. Um, and so we give, up, we give up time and we try to use that money to do things for our children. But the, I think the, the problem is we always think about poverty just in terms of money and we ignore time. So if we basically uh, take a two-parent family and take both of them out of the home and have them work 60 hours a week, and suddenly now they're making enough money to be above the poverty line, then we say, check, those kids aren't poor anymore. But in fact, we probably just put them in a different type of poverty. Shifting gears a little bit, one of the major issues that we work with in, at the Texas Public Policy Foundation is the child welfare system, child protective services, foster care, adoption. And there's this line that we struggle with and that we have to walk on 
when and how should government be allowed to intervene in the private realm of the family? Obviously, parents do not have a right to harm their children, and there is a role for government to play when children are abused to step in and to protect those children and to potentially remove them from harmful situations. However, the debate over where that line is often comes down to on, uh, though, on the side of those who advocate for a more interventionist government on this idea of, well, we have to protect the rights of children. And inherent within that argument is this understanding that the rights of children are somehow in opposition to the rights of parents. I've never seen it that way, but I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on, is there this inherent conflict between the rights of children and the rights of parents? Yeah, so I love that word conflict because like at the core of parenting is, is conflict. I mean, there's, it's unavoidable. Like if you're gonna be a good parent, you're gonna to have to encounter conflict. Now the key about being a good parent is to embrace that conflict with love and caring and compassion. And what I mean is, what do I, what do I mean that there's conflict at the core of parenting? What, what does every five-year-old, seven-year-old, nine-year-old wanna do, especially a boy? They wanna eat candy all day and play video games. Like honestly, that would be their dream. Like, like if you leave a kid home alone all day by themselves without any structure, that is what they will do. Uh, the question is like, would they get sick of it at some point? Possibly. But ultimately what you're trying to do as a parent is trying to bring them from kind of a state of the world where they, they think they know what they want to a, a place in the world where they, they experience the good life. And, and the good life is one of um, sacrifice and service and love and kindness and education and reading and art. Uh, like, let's just take art for an example. Like, like most kids don't like to go to art museums. I didn't, but at some point I fell in love with art museums. And, and now I look back and I'm like, wow, why couldn't, why couldn't my seven-year-old self see how amazing art is? Like that I can go into an art museum and feel such happiness and joy. Like why did my seven-year-old self not know how to do that? It's because my seven-year-old self wasn't ready for it. And, and my mom tried in so many different ways. And I'm so grateful because my mom did all these things that allowed my current self now to have this different way of, of experiencing happiness. And I think that's true about almost every aspect of children's lives is sleep is helpful. Going to school is really helpful. Eating your vegetables is really helpful. <laughs> but these are all things that uh, ultimately sometimes re result in some conflict between the parents kind of, but I don't think of it as a conflict between their rights. It's really what the parent is doing is shepherding the child for just a, a time until the child can become the person that that they really would want to be if they could look back and, and give their uh, child self some advice. When we were planning this, you said something that stuck with me. As parents, we actually are restricting the liberty of our children <laughs> so that they can maximize liberty later on. Yeah, for and sure. And I think that for me especially, it was a really helpful way of thinking through both my children's rights and my rights and more importantly, my responsibility yeah. and my role as a father. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, you know, there are circumstances when it's necessary yeah. for the government to step in and the challenge is determining how and when this type of intervention is necessary. So in your opinion, how should society be approaching these decisions, especially given the tendency of government to micromanage parental decision making? Sure, yeah. I mean, this is where um, uh, Melissa Michelle has this fantastic book called To Whom Do Children Belong? And really she says the government should definitely intervene when there's abuse. Period. So basically, yeah, so obviously there, there's sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse. So those are all cases in which the government should, should intervene and protect uh, children. Now, now what gets tricky is what constitutes abuse. And um, so I'll give one example from my childhood. I, I hate wearing a coat. I never wear a coat my whole childhood. And you live in Utah. I grew up in Oregon, but, and then my son, my son as well, does not wear a coat, wear shorts the whole school year, walks to school in the snow in his shorts. <laughs> so luckily I live in a state where they don't call, you know, social services about this, but Oregon was a state where, you know, a, 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 you know, obviously a caring teacher was concerned that maybe my parents were neglecting me in some way. And so she contacted social services and let them know that um, I wasn't wearing a coat to school. Okay, so does, does not wearing a coat constitute abuse? I, uh, so that's where like you get then you start to ask like well like and this is where I get really worried is a lot of the things I mentioned about my family culture so we we're a, we're a family we go to bed on time we have bedtimes we put limits on on how much media we use 
We eat lots of vegetables. We eat dinner as a family. None of these are controversial. So those are part of my, my culture. That These are family rules. And not all families adopt these same rules, but those are ones that nobody would, would disagree with. But then we start to get into rules that maybe someone would disagree with and might even call abuse. Like we go to church on Sunday and it's like, we tell our kids, you get to choose, you get to make the decisions later on, but right now you're, it, it's just like we go to school. Like we go to school because it's, it's good for us. We go to church because it's good for us. We, we read the scriptures, we pray, we fast, we serve. And so I would, I'd hate to have someone look at my family culture, look, look at the bundle of, that my wife and I have chosen and say, uh, you can't do that one. You can't do that one. You can't do that one. Now, obviously, if, if part of our family culture involved physical, emotional, sexual abuse, then, then that's definitely where we could step in. I just, I just worry about a state that gives themselves too much power to think about what constitutes right. abuse. Yeah. yeah, your example about the coat brings yeah. to mind some work <laughs> that we've been doing recently around the issue of neglect. Yeah. And the state of Texas, about 75% of the kids who enter the child welfare system enter because of accusations of neglect. Mm -hmm. And this last year, we did a study looking at, okay, how does neglect relate to childhood poverty in Texas? And what we found in that study was if you were a child living in one of the 25 poorest counties in Texas, you're statistically more likely to have intervention with social services based on a pure neglect allegation. So what I mean by pure neglect is you will often see, okay, you have neglect and physical abuse, or you have neglect and sexual abuse. We threw out those cases. And we looked only at those cases where neglect was the only thing alleged. And that's where we got kids in 25, the 25 poorest counties in Texas are more likely to have interactions with social services. What we can extrapolate from that is poverty is a key factor in a family's interaction with the child welfare system. And the Texas legislature, to their great credit, grappled with this um, during the last regular session of the legislature. We've had two special sessions. We're probably going to have a third one here in the next few weeks. Uh, but earlier this year, we changed, and it goes into effect today, actually, uh, we changed the definition of neglect in Texas to prevent those interventions where families are just struggling with poverty yeah. and will benefit more from interaction with the community, with churches or other charitable organizations that can help them you know, deal with temporary homelessness or get an air conditioning unit put in or any number, get a coat, yeah. For example, um, those should not be reasons for government coming into your life because when we come down to it, that intervention in and of itself is a trauma yeah, for yeah. that child. And I don't know if your research has looked at the trauma of child welfare involvement or how that impacts child development. Yeah, no, I haven't looked at that through a research lens, but I mean, any kind of ethno ethnographical account of the foster care system just breaks your heart because, and it's so hard on both sides, which is you talk to the foster care parents and they really struggle because it's hard to just, it's hard to bring a teenager into your home mm -hmm. and become their parent. Like uh, it's hard enough to parent a teenager without having, you know, that like the relationship built up right. to that point. I also think like what you're saying about neglect is really interesting because obviously the Charlie Bucket's kind of interesting because you say that looks like a, a bad home to be raised in, but uh, there's some really amazing things going on in his home. And then I think of like the free range parenting movement which is, I, I, love, I love living in a neighborhood where my daughters can just walk other places and go find their friends and then go to the park. And I, I don't know, like, I think there's some parents that feel like that's maybe an unsafe thing to do, or maybe it looks like neglectful, but that's the hard thing about this. Um, parents have different priorities of what's important to them. And for me, the fact that my daughters are creating friendships with our neighbors and, and they feel comfortable and that our neighbors feel comfortable coming over to our house. I, I kind of love that neighborhood uh, feel. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of tend to be more of a free range parent. So I, I hope, uh, you know, so I kind of embrace that type of movement as well. Yeah. That's an absolutely fascinating yeah. movement. We've been fortunate to work with Lenore Skinnese, okay. who is kind of the founder yeah. of the free range, or popularized free range yeah. parenting. And she's an absolutely fascinating yeah. person if you have a chance to talk okay. with her. Another area of interest in your research is the impact of bias and prejudice yeah. on a number of different yeah. settings. And probably one of your papers that I found the most interesting was you did a study of bias and prejudice with NBA referees, which validates so yeah. many of the things that I scream at my television screen. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I'm interested to know in what ways do you see various forms of bias and prejudice, not necessarily just racial sure. bias and yeah, prejudice, yeah. playing out into family regulation decisions? Yeah, pre prejudice is so, so tricky. Um, 
I mean, that was what's so interesting about doing the MBA study is to take a setting in which people are making decisions in front of thousands of people. They're being televised and monitored. And yet even in that setting, they were being racially biased in their decision making. Uh, the neat thing is once they became aware of it, they were able to make it go away. So the neat thing is that we have, we all have biases that we can make go away. Now, so, and the thing is, I think um, there's some biases that are gonna hurt us as a society. So like a parent that doesn't want their child taught by a black teacher is, is, is depriving their child of the benefits of that diversity in their child's life. So I would, I would be so excited to have my child taught by someone who was ethnically or culturally diverse. Because I, I love, I mean, I'd love to have my children live in other countries on, on occasion, just so they can have that diversity in their life. So that I would say like, you know, a parent who's being racially prejudiced against a childcare provider or a teacher is, is actually like hurting their child. Mm -hmm. Now here's where prejudice is trickier, is um, imagine now I'm gonna pick a place to leave my kids during the day. So imagine I'm not, I'm not rich enough to go to a, you know, a formal childcare arrangement, so I'm gonna be dropping this child off at someone's home. So these are self-employed childcare workers. And they actually show up in the census. You can look in the census data, you can see self-employed childcare workers. So you might ask a second, well, how many of those self-employed childcare workers are men? Okay. You can guess what the number is. I'd imagine fairly small. It's very small, it's yeah. about less than 1%. Okay. So, you know, it's hard to know if that's supply or demand, but with a little bit of introspection, you say like, okay, would I drop my kids off? And so the question is, am I being prejudiced? Am I prejudiced against men? I don't know, it's so hard. Like that's where it gets hard. That's where prejudice runs into protection. Right. And I, I, I don't know, like this is what's neat about parents is we, we actually have the right to statistically discriminate in order to protect our children. And so I probably wouldn't drop my children off at a, a man who was running a self, you know, a daycare center in his home. And maybe that's a dysfunctional bias, but I don't know. I just, and but the thing is like, once people play that thought experiment out, like even people that um, tend to be pretty, um, pretty open in most of their ways of thinking, once you start to talk about your children, it's a totally different ballgame. Mm -hmm. And then here's another thought experiment that you can do. This is about religious, um, religious bias. So imagine you're writing your will, you've got your two kids, and you have to decide which of your siblings to leave your kids with. And let's just suppose you have two siblings, one who's, who's, who's um, well off financially, fantastic home, great neighborhood, but hates God. And you have the other sibling who's not as well off, you know, maybe never went to college, you know, not in his great neighborhood, but loves God with all their heart. Mm -hmm. The question is, if you're a religiously motivated person, who do you leave the kids with? Mm -hmm. And I, like, I'm not saying that there's a right answer. I, I would leave my child with the sibling that loves God. Um, but that the fact that that's a hard decision indicates that actually parents are have biases mm -hmm. based on someone's religious beliefs. And so it becomes interesting that obviously I can write this into my will. Now, the question is, if I place my child for adoption, right? or if my child gets put into the foster care system, should I be given those same privileges? So imagine I'm an Amish mother and uh, my child's being placed for adoption. Should I have the right to ask or require that the child be placed into an Amish family so that it can be raised consistent with my beliefs? Or imagine I'm a Muslim mother, we have that same ability. And, and sadly, what we have is, a, is a, a world in which those parental preferences which we get to exercise while we're alive and we get to exercise through a will, we do not get to exercise once we relinquish them over to mm -hmm. the state. And I think that probably has a lot to do with why our adoption placement rates are so low among teenage mothers, where the adoption placement rate is less than 1%. Um, so from a policy standpoint yeah. going into yeah. um, the adoption issue, would you say that we should give more respect to the wishes of a mother who places their child for adoption um, in terms of selecting the adoptive family of directing the religious upbringing or the educational upbringing of their child. Yeah, I, I think it would have a huge impact on uh, a mother's willingness to basically give their child a gift of adoption to like acknowledge that I, I'm not in a position to be the parent I want to be. And so I'm going to gift this child. Uh, I think that gift is more likely to happen when a parent can get the assurance that the person who that's gonna take their place is going to raise their child in the way that they would want to do themselves if they were in a better position. Now, the harder question 
What about the involuntary termination? Yeah. The parent who has their child removed into foster care yeah. and is moving to having their rights terminated. Yeah. How much, if at all, should the state look to their preferences for their child? And I think obviously it depends on why. Well, that's why I think you take the steps. You say, obviously in my will, I can stipulate which person I want to raise my children. Okay, now if we apply that to when I place my child for adoption, I think the natural extension is then even when the government takes my child against my will, it would be it would be really nice, or at least it would give me some comfort in a horrible situation right. to know that at least at least my child is going to be raised consistent with the things that are important to to me. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'll, I'll be a little personal. I, I think my mom's okay with me sharing this, but you know, my mom had a, a pregnancy when she was a teenager. And so she was able to place the child for adoption through a religious organization. And so as a result, you know, the child was raised in a wonderful family that kind of had the safe, same faith tradition as my mother. And the, the amazing thing about that is it gave my mom a do-over. And so she was able to finish high school, go to college, graduate from college, marry a college graduate. Uh, she ended up having five additional children, all of whom have graduated from college. The child she placed for adoption finished college. So you have this like interesting moment in time where my mom's having to make a decision as a teenager about whether to keep the child. And because, I, I don't know if it was solely because of that religious adoption agency that helped her make that tough decision, but because of that, you can think of the two paths. There could have been the teenage mother path or the place my child for adoption path. And it's amazing that this was like a $4 million decision. Because <laughs> if you think about like all the lives that were impacted by that oh, decision, yeah. uh, I mean, not, not that, not that it's not possible to have a great life as a teenage mother. It's just that the odds are stacked against you. That like the chance of my mother finishing college would have been much lower. The chance of, of that child finishing college would have been much lower. The chance of all of my mother's future children finishing college would have been much lower. The chance of my mother marrying someone who had finished college would have been much lower. And so she would have been on this income path. And you can actually follow the income path of all those children over here. And then you can see what's happened today where all of my siblings have... Um, you know, they're all married, they have their own children that are going to be going and having flourishing lives. And so it was like that one moment. And so I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of like, how do we create the ability for more teenagers who find themselves in that situation to, to feel comfortable, you know, gifting over right. their child? Yeah. Well, and ultimately, what we've been talking about today, when you try to sum it all up is, how do we create an environment in which parents of all shapes and sizes right are in a position to where they can make the best decision yeah. for their children in all facets of life. Yeah. Um, and we could talk about this for hours. Yeah. I you know, wish we had more time, <laughs> yeah. but I do want to open it up a little bit for audience Q&A, but thank you so much yeah, for, for sure. your time today and for making the trip down to be with us. Um, we will have folks walking around the room here uh, in the theater with microphones. If you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, the rule at the Texas Public Policy Foundation is a question is a short statement that ends in a question mark and that nice little uptick in your voice at the end. <laughs> um, and I'll be on the phone looking at questions as well. I am paying attention to you. I'm not selling things on eBay. I think we've got a question right here in the front. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, first time. Um, in the light of some of your uh, discussions of public policy and distinctions, the last one about religion, what's the state of uh, inter-nation, interstate of questions my, people might put about adoption with regard to race? Mm. Um, is this a permitted thing? Does, um, uh, um, should there be restrictions on this? Does it require racial courts uh, to determine uh, the eligibility of people um, in accord with, you know, the, um, I get government forms. Um, <laughs> I mark all the boxes. <laughs> and uh, for, for Bill Allen once said to me, they got a box for you. <laughs> so, uh, so I think what you're getting at is, obviously I said that there, there's a case to be made for wanting someone of my own faith to raise my children. Yeah. So the question is, uh, would there be a place for me to say, I want my children raised by someone of my same ethnicity or my same race? Uh, and um, again, that's why I kind of wanted to start with the idea of prejudice, which is I, I think that part of what we want to do as a society 
is, is root out racism that blocks us from giving our children gifts, which is if there was a wonderful family of a different race that wanted that, that, that we're in a good position to raise my children, that I should be excited about that. So the, the hardest thing about racism though is you can, you can create policies that try to get around racism, but ultimately racism is something that has to be rooted out. Um, and so I, yeah, so I don't, um, so I guess what you're asking is if, uh, if there was that form that I was filling out when I was placing my child for adoption, should there be a question that allows me to indicate a race? No, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't check that box, but I don't know, maybe, but here, let, let's put it in the different, maybe if I was a Native American, would, would it be okay for me to think that actually I really like to have my child raised by a Native American? Or if I was, if I was from China and, and it'd be really neat to have a, like if I felt like part of my cultural heritage was embedded in my ethnicity or my race, I could maybe see that happening. I think it really gets back at the motivation for why someone checks that box. I, I think there's like a really good argument for why we might be religiously motivated to want to do that. I, I, don't, um, I don't see a stronger case, at least for me personally, for why I would be motivated to have my children raised by a particular race. We've got several good questions coming in from folks watching the live stream. And uh, I'm gonna combine two of them that I think are hitting on the same issue. Um, questions about the way for parents to be involved with their kids' lives outside of the home, especially yeah. as it relates to schools. And when parents feel that their school is pushing a particular agenda that is contrary to their family's values, what advice do you have for parents in those situations? Yeah, so I mean, so the, first of all, what, what can I do as a parent? And then what can I do as a citizen in my community? So I think as a parent, the most important thing is to be there at the crossroads. And, um, and the neat thing is now so much of our children's lives are documented through their interaction on devices, which I, I, I hate. I hate the fact that most of their interactions are happening through devices. But the one nice thing is it creates a, a really fantastic way to, to have a discussion with them about how they're navigating their social interactions. I mean, in the pre-smartphone pre world, I never would have been privy to all of their little conversations. Mm -hmm. But now that all those little conversations are actually happening in electronic forms, it actually makes it great to have that discussion. And so you might, as a parent, ask, like, would I feel comfortable sitting down and reading the texts of my daughter sitting next to her? And many of you would say, well, that's a massive invasion of her privacy. And I would say, what if she lets you do it? And you say, well, she doesn't let me do it. Then I would say, well, what would it take to get your relationship to the place where she would be comfortable doing that? So that's kind of what I would say at the parenting level is that there's this like deep connection you can have with your kids where you're involved in their, their lives. Now, uh, what do we do about the fact that when we send our kids to schools, we're basically re relinquishing control over the schools in terms of what the schools are gonna teach. I think from a public policy perspective, probably the best solution, and this is uh, Melissa Moschella's solution, is I really think that uh, charter schools are a fantastic way um, to, to bring about what I would think of as the ability to align the, the, the kind of goals of the public education system with the goals of, of the parents. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really grateful to be part of a charter school that I think is pretty closely aligned with what we feel as parents. In particular, uh, our charter school uses uniforms. And I went to the public school and I said, would you ever consider using uniforms? And they're like, we would never use uniforms. And I said, um, I said, my son got bullied at your school because he's the kid that doesn't wear the coat. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, and the uniform took that away. The, the uniform just like created a level playing field for all the kids and I love that. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of took one kind of thing I didn't like about the school out. Now we can talk about uh, sex education or other things. I think the other thing about a responsive charter school is then parents can be part of that discussion and think about what's age appropriate. The hardest thing about sex education is that kids are at very different levels at different times. And so I think one of the things I found a little frustrating about sex education in high school is that obviously some of my peers were a lot more experienced uh, than I was. And, and to have them treat it callously was not the way that I'd been taught about sex education mm -hmm. in my home. And so I, I didn't, so it, like, I think a lot of people are always worried about the curriculum, which we should be. But I think a lot of the curriculum happens from your classmates. And so when you have, you know, just having a respectful environment where people can be uh, kind of validated in their, their feelings and beliefs. So. Do we have other questions in the room? Right there in the back. 
Hi, thanks for your reflections. I, we were talking earlier, you were talking earlier about um, appropriate interventions from the state involving uh, allegations of abuse and those that might not be appropriate or just. And something that is concerning to me and that I've been paying attention to is gender ideology and the role, the language that proponents of some of these ideologies are using around how it's ab abusive to deny certain identities. And so I'm wondering uh, your thoughts on that. And then also if you're seeing in, in your work in public policy, either of you, um, arguments being listened to it, in around these kinds of questions of calling things abuse, which would be very concerning to a wide variety of parents and, and families. Yeah, I don't know how to answer that one actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, basically as a rule, we don't get involved proactively in what we would consider quote unquote culture war issues. There are a number of organizations out there that have staked that field that we think are doing excellent work. It's not something that was part of our founding or has been part of our principles. Now, I will say it does overlap in my work quite a bit, uh, especially recently. Um, and I'm wary of any type of standard that government would apply to judging parents that has an agenda behind it. And that's a neutral statement regardless of whether it's a gender identity or something that I might agree with as a conservative and personally a religiously conservative person. Um, you know, I don't think the government should be in the place of imposing values onto the public. And it's especially abhorrent in my mind when government is imposing um, its own view of how parents should be raising their children um, through the mechanism of the state and through the police power of the state, the, that threat of, well, if you're not raising your kids the way that we think you should be raising your kids, we're going to go ahead and take them from you, right? That's a hard line in the sand that we will always push back and fight against, but yeah, and I think like the Yoder versus Virginia, Wisconsin, totally different issue than gender ideology, but it was a case in which a culture conflicted with the way that the public school culture. Um, so this was an Amish community in which the, you know, the superintendent felt like the kids should be enrolled in the school. And, and the Amish community was basically saying, look, we, we raise our children differently than you. We have different values than you. We teach our kids different things than you do, but our kids turn out good. And, and they're hardworking and they're kind and they're loving. Um, they might look different than what your kids look like. So that's the hardest thing is like different cultures place different values on things. And actually here's one, um, the Cal Grant in California, there was some legislation to not let people use this at religious schools. So I was really curious about the data. So I was really curious where Hispanics go to college and Hispanics in California, many of them go to Catholic colleges. And so you'd ask, well, why, why do so many of the Hispanics go to Catholic colleges? And I think it's because parents feel pretty safe sending their kids to a college that's going to be kind of consistent with their beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so if, if the government were to kind of have stripped away the Cal Grant from those, I, I would worry about, you know, like a parent that might opt out of the, out of a world in which they have to make this trade-off between highly educated children, but children that might actually have to, you know, have some of their faith kind of challenged or other things. I really like this question from an online viewer. When is the best time to get married? <laughs> and should you have gotten to specific milestones in your life and in your relationship before you consider marriage? Yeah, so here's a, here's a question. Is there a downside of getting married while you're in college? So that, that'd be one, one way to phrase it, because I don't, I don't think we should prescribe a certain age. Uh, obviously, we don't want to get married in high school, so we're not really talking about teenage marriages. But really, the debate now is like, should I wait till I'm 27? Should I wait till I'm 34? Should I wait till I have a job? There's something beautiful about getting married while you're in college. There's a couple things. One is it's a really easy time to date because there's tons of free things you can do. You can meet a lot of people. You'll never be around so many highly educated people that are like you. Um, so for those of you that are parents of kids getting near college, I would never like discourage them from thinking of it as a possibility. The other thing is I, I got married in college and then I went to grad school and all my classmates were like, oh, it must be so hard going to grad school while you're married. And I was like, no, it's like so much easier. I, I basically, I would go work from nine to five. I felt like I was pretty productive during those hours. And then I'd come home and my wife would be like, how did, how did things go today? 
And I felt like that accountability partner um, made it so I didn't waste time. I got done pretty quick because we were excited to together move on to the next stage. So I, I don't know, like I, um, I guess I'd hate to tell you, you have to get married under some timetable. I just, I don't think like you should say like, I shouldn't, I'm not gonna marry till 27 because it's kind of blocking you off from those friendships that might re result in marriage. Okay. We've got time for one or two more questions. Any folks in the room with anything? All right, uh, the last one then, what is your single best argument as to why people should get married and have children, especially for somebody who may not believe in the institution of marriage sure. or the family? And that was another online question. Yeah, I would say if your goal in life is to uh, become the kind of person that's gonna be kind and generous and serving and happy, there's something about marriage and parenting that just strips away all the, all the chaff. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, so, and I, I said, it's even, it's even more apparent when you have a lot of children. So when you have seven children, it strips away all the pride in your life because there's no way, like when you go to church, there's no way all your kids are going to have their hair done. Like there's always going to be something you missed. And um, there's no way to look cool when you're driving a huge 12 passenger van. That's kind of the big family side, but I think like there's something about taking your life and getting it to match up that involves sacrifice and change that I think is like the whole purpose of why we're here on earth. And so like, I would say like, why, why should you get married and have children? Because it'll change you who you are and turn you into someone that's more compassionate and kind and, and happy. Well, Dr. Price, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you all for joining us, uh, our live streams and now live events back in the theater here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation continue. If you'd like more information, please visit us online at texaspolicy.com. You can sign up for email alerts and see all the exciting events that we'll be having coming up. Thank you all very much. Have a great day.